Um, so to close this session, I will um, tell you a few things about, about a short experiment that I did to extract an etymological database from Wiktionary data. And I'm Benoit Sago from Inria in Paris. So the motivations behind this work were the following. Well, someone earlier on this morning said that um, paper dictionaries are dead. Well, etymological dictionaries are still mostly paper dictionaries, so this is not really true for all kinds of dictionaries. And there are indeed very few electronic lexical resources that contain structured etymological information. And that's bad, because such information would be very useful for uh, different types of applications, such as computational approaches to the phonetic and semantic evolution of languages, as well as computational approaches to etymological research. And such research, such research would be interesting for linguistic purposes, but they actually raise a lot of interesting computational problems as well. And for this reason, it would be very interesting to be able to carry them out. Now, how can we best take advantage of decades of research in historical linguistics? Well, the simple idea is to just find an, a reasonably reliable and reasonably large resource and to try and convert it into a formalized and maybe even standardized uh, electronic resource. So that's what we tried. Before uh, talking about uh, uh, talking a bit more about existing resources and about the Wiktionary, uh, which is the one we used, I would like to say a few words about existing etymological and lexical creation mechanisms, something you probably already know, but it's just to, you know, um, to have everything in mind and to agree on the terminology. So, what is an etymological relation? It's a relation between two lexemes. That some, seems to be very pretty obvious, but it, as we will see, it is not that obvious. And here I will define a lexeme as a triple made from a language name or identifier, citation form, and a meaning. And by convention, we will uh, denote the meaning by a list of English glosses. Um, and of course, an etymological relation can relate a target lexeme to one source lexemes or to several source lexemes, depending on the situation. So here are a few examples, for example, French manger, which means to eat, comes from Old French manger, which means to eat. And that's one example of a relation with one to one, and one, well, whereas éponger has been created by morphological derivation by combining the French names éponge, which means sponge, and the uh, suffix er, which is how we made verbs from nouns. And of course, you, we can define direct relations uh, as opposed to indirect relations. Direct relations would be relations between two lexemes that are directly related. So, for example, French manger comes from Old French manger. This is not a direct relation if you have an inventor of languages in which you have a Middle French, right? Whereas then the two intermediate relations would be direct. Now, of course, etymological relations can, can be of different types. So that's just an, a brief overview of what we can define. Of course, direct inheritance uh, is the most straightforward one. Borrowing or is, is quite frequent as well. And then you have all the different types of lexical, lexical creation mechanisms, such as morphological derivation and morphological composition. Um, in the work I'm presenting here, I have discarded, at least for now, portmanteau words and uh, truncation and other more complex phenomenon, phenomena. So just an example. Um, so this is a brief sketch of the etymology of the French word abricot, which means apricot. It probably comes from Spanish albaricoque, or whatever you pronounce that, which means the same, which itself is a borrowing from Arabic uh, with the article glued, like borrowed together with the name of the apricot in Arabic at the time when this happened. And interestingly, this Arabic name is actually a borrowing from um, Greek, as in Byzantine Greek, which, is in, uh, which 
comes, is inherited from ancient Greek praikokion, which itself was a borrowing from Latin praikokum, which means precocious, and that's because apricot um, is a precocious fruit. So you see, when you want to have the etymology of a word as like, basic as abricot or English apricot, sometimes you kind of travel around Europe and sometimes even a little bit further with uh, a complex etymological chain. Um, as far as related work is concerned, there are two different things that I would like to say a few words about. The first one is work by especially uh, Bowers and uh, Romary about uh, standardization of etymological information in dictionaries. Uh, they have published uh, last year a draft with a few proposals for the standardization of etymological information in uh, TEI encoded dictionaries which builds on earlier work, especially by Salmon Alt, uh, 2006. And in these uh, proposi propositions, they rely on a large typology of etymological ty uh, relation types that include standard inheritance, borrowing, but also metaphor, metonymy, composition, and grammaticalization. And so that goes a little bit beyond what we'll be dealing with today. Another aspect, like another part of the related work, is existing electronic structured etymological dictionaries. I said these are rare, but these, some of them do exist. One of them is the World Loan, one, loan Word Database, uh, which includes lexemes for um, one and a half thousand meanings in 41 typologically diverse languages associated with a score which assesses the probability of being a loan word. That's interesting, but it's just 41, type of 41 languages, and of course the, the etymological relations that are stored in this resource are, are all of the type borrowing. Um, now, there is a very interesting resource which I didn't know about, or which did not exist at the time I, I did the work presented here, which is the Diachronic Atlas of Comparative Linguistics, uh, developed in uh, Sweden with a freely downloadable database. It includes uh, around 50,000 lexemes in 500 languages from 18 families, and it also includes 27,000 non-typed etymological relations. So that, that's quite, in, but it's, it has been manually developed, so it's a very complementary resource uh, to the one I'm presenting today. And then, for those who are interested, there are a few other resources which, for one reason or the other, or another, are not really uh, reliable or reliable enough. And then there is the etymological wordnet, which uh, was developed by De Mello and uh, presented in 2014. It's also extracted from Wiktionary, a dump that dates back to 2013. But it has two major limitations. Uh, if you remember my first slide, I, I, I said that an etymological relation has to be a, a relation between lexemes. Well, in that case, uh, it is a relation between lemmas, which is not really a good thing. Um, so ignoring the meanings, so polysemy, homonymy, all of this is discarded, so that's not really useful as such. And plus, um, n there, are, there are no distinctions between relation types apart from the cognation relation, so cogn two cognates just have somehow a common origin, so cognation relation is identified, but all others, all interesting ones, are not uh, so they're put together. Okay, so... Um, for all these reasons, uh, I started extracting and structuring Wiktionary's etymological information. So basically, if you have a look at uh, the English Wiktionary, uh, the entry for uh, French manger, uh, which is the same example as before, it means to eat, uh, this is the kind of thing you get. So you get a, some etymological information, which is basically correct. Right? And you have almost a million such etymological uh, snippets. Now, this is the source code um, of the same page. Uh, and you see this is obvious. This is what you get when you download the dump. So this is our basis. And we have, well, the first step was to kind of clean this wiki formatted thing and to turn it into some exploitable 
XML-like entry. So that's the first preliminary step. As you can see, forms with their glosses and language codes are identified using dedicated templates, which allowed us to create form elements with the language code and, and the gloss, glosses and you know, st structure the whole thing a little bit. So that's our basic input. That's the preliminary step. Now, um, how did we construct something interesting from this? Well, the problem with the pseudo XML that I uh, have just shown you is that the etymological information is still in English, of course. And, but the second problem, which is actually a, a bigger problem, is that glosses of a given lexeme can vary from one occurrence of this lexeme to the other. So two different articles might refer to the same lexeme in a given language, and they might be glossed in different ways or have no gloss at all. And what we want to do is to merge these lexemes. Um, so the first step was to add missing glosses in cases where it's very easy to do. So for example, in the entry for, for manger, the one we saw before, if the etymological information starts with from manger in Middle French, you can infer that the manger in Middle French probably means to eat exactly in the same way as the head word. Now, the second step is to extract uh, lexemes and relations from the English text. So that's just regular expressions on you know, the different ways uh, you can express etymological relations in English, um, because basically it's always the same uh, structures, um, and you can rely on that. And then uh, we did some iterative fusion of lexemes. That's the problem I, we're trying to address, the problem I just mentioned. Um, so what we did is the following. If you have two different lexemes with the same lemma, so the same citation form, and the same language code, um, if one is glossed and the other is not, and you have just two, two, two different, not three for the same lemma in language, then you merge them. Um, another rule is if two lexemes have the same citation form and language, and both are glossed, and they have some gloss in common, then we merge them. So for example, bêtement, if it's glossed stupidly, foolishly somewhere, and stupidly, idiot idiotically in another article, we will consider that because they have stupidly in common, they can be merged. And then, we, of course, we update relations accordingly, and uh, we iterate this until stability. Then finally, we correct some of the relation types. For example, it, it is not possible to inherit a lex from a lexeme of the same language. Uh, that's not inheritance. It would probably be morphological derivation or whatever, but not inheritance. So we discard them. Um, and of course, we eliminate redundant in, in indirect relations. So if you have in the database that A comes from B and B comes from C, you're not really interested in adding the relation that A comes from C, because you, already, you have more fine-grained information already. So just a few examples of the uh, um, inf relations that we have extracted. Um, so you see the two first ones are inheritance. The third one I've already uh, shown it to you is um, suffixation, so suffixal derivation. Then you have different, a different type of derivation, and then two borrowings. Uh, so our results, um, after applying the uh, lexeme fusion algorithm that I have just described briefly, we have almost one million lexemes. Um, and half a million etymological relations. So, this, so these are two, 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 technically two different databases, a lexeme database and a relation database, and both databases are, of course, available uh, freely. I will give the URL a bit later in two different formats. One is CSV, I will show an example just afterwards, and one is uh, in an XML format that is basically based on a, an extension of the propositions by Bowers and, Roma, and Romary that I mentioned before. We had to extend their standardization proposal because um, their proposals did not support the cognition relation, did not support cross-references, 
so cross references that are etymologies such as C other lexeme. Okay, um, they did not at that time allow for um, a recursive use of the etym uh, element, which is the main element in their standard, uh, and we needed to represent etymological chains such as the apricot story that I uh, told you about before, and we extended also. Uh, this proposal in order to support ambiguity because, of course, when you extract information from the dictionary, sometimes for the same lexeme you have different etymologies or different ways to represent the same etymology. Um, so you need to have alternatives at some point. So, for example, if we start from uh, gostinu, which is common Slavic for guest, we can we have extracted that it comes from gosti, which means guest plus a suffix, and that gosti is from Proto-Indo-European gostis, uh, which means stranger guest host, so that's the example I will show you in CSV and XML format. So in CSV, you see you have um, here first the list of lexemes that are involved in this etymology with uh, unique IDs, and then these IDs are of course used to define relations. Um, these negative ideas are here to create compounds, so we create a compound here with gosti and inu, and then we use the resulting compounds in the relation. Now that's part of the XML version of the same thing. Um, that's good for computational users, uh, well, users, but not for reading it with the human eyes, I guess. Um, so of course we want to try and evaluate this. Um, to know whether we have valuable information, usable information. And evaluating such a database involves answering quite a few questions. The first one is what is the quality of the etymological information in Wiktionary in the first place? Um, so, of course, evaluating this um, lies beyond the scope of this work, but my first impression is that it is surprisingly good. Um, I think people are interested in etymology and, and they tend to be happy if there is correct etymological information. This applies to the, to the English edition of the dictionary, not necessary to other editions. The second question is what errors are caused by um, the way we extract and unstructure the non-structured information that is uh, in the dictionary. The third, the third question is what errors are caused by a gloss, the gloss inference algorithm and the lexeme fusion algorithm and um, Conversely, what is the rec recall of these algorithms, and especially the fusion algorithm? Uh, uh, and finally, what errors result from using inheritance as the default relation? Because uh, when the relation uh, is not explicitly specified in the text in, uh, found on Wiktionary, uh, there is a default behavior that, um, by default, the relation is inheritance. I will skip this slide, which was about the lexeme fusion algorithm. Just the conclusion is that these fusion thingies introduce very few errors, but there is a lot more fusion to do. Uh, so basically what I get is an, a, an inventory of lexemes in which several, well, in which a given lexeme is likely to have several entries that were not successfully merged. But it's better to have a low, a low recall in this step and a good precision than to merge everything with everything and get just noise. Now, the overall evaluation, um, we did it in two different ways. The first way is uh, that we manually evaluated a randomly selected set of 100 etymological relations. Out of these, uh, 78 are correct. Um, 18 are not correct, but the only problem is the type of the relation, which is inheritance, because that's the default relation and it should have been borrowing. There are three other type errors, and just one of the 100 uh, relations is just not correct. Uh, so that's quite reassuring, because if we had a precise um, encoding of our inventory of languages and of the relations between these languages, we would probably be able to identify that some of the inheritance links which are inheritance just because it's the default type, cannot be inheritance. Right? If th th it's not possible to have inheritance, for example, 
taking this apricot example from Arabic to Spanish, because this is not inheritance, this should be borrowing. And if we know that Spanish does not come from Arabic as a language, we could be able to correct these errors. Of course, another thing we did is to compare uh, our results with uh, a team WordNet, so the Demelo resource. We had to downgrade our databases, we had to remove all glosses and to ignore meanings, because that's what the situation is in ATIM WordNet. We had to ignore relation types apart from the cognition relation. And doing this reduced the number of relations to, yet again, half a million, out of which 83% are missing from the ATIM WordNet. Um, but in, conversely, uh, almost 400,000 relations are, f are found only in ATIM WordNet and not in our databases. But out of those, 88% relate to forms from the same language. So they are likely to encode derivation, morphological derivation mechanisms, composition mechanisms, and so on and so forth. And these, are th these bits of information are extracted from a section that I did not uh, use, that is the section derived terms, not the section etymology in the articles. So what I can tell is because of these figures, but more importantly because of the fact that we do not discard glosses and meanings, and because we have typed the relations, uh, I, I, I believe uh, the database that uh, we have created is qualitatively and quantitatively richer than this etym wordnet. Um, so, of course, there are quite a few areas for improvement. Um, we could extend the cleaning, lexeme extraction, and relation extraction patterns. We could improve the lexeme fusion algorithm, for example, by taking advantage of uh, resources such as WordNet, um, and also try, trying to take into account formal variation uh, when words are very our lookalikes and have the same meaning. It's probably an interesting piece of information. And again, if we had a more precise uh, modeling of the relations between languages, uh, we could correct a few relation times, as I already exemplified. And we could, as well, correct and add new entries. For example, um, if you know that French chapitre comes from Old French chapitre, and you know that between Fre French and Old French, you have Middle French, then it is very likely that in Middle French, this word was the same, because it's, you know, it was already chapitre before, it's now, so it's likely to be the same in the intermediate step. And once this database will have reached a sufficient quality, um, and because it's a freely available resource, uh, it will probably allow for uh, lexical creation and extension for the intermediate language, which are uh, languages which are very often uh, poorly co uh, covered in terms of resources. Uh, it could allow for some work in digital historical linguistics, uh, as in um, developing a, a, an interface for querying these etymological databases. And more interestingly, it would uh, enable uh, things uh, in computational historical linguistics, such as the automatic or semi-automatic extraction of sound laws, um, the evaluation of the database consistency and detection, and the detection of analogical leveling mechanisms by applying these extracted laws, and more generally, it could serve as a basis towards uh, supervised or semi-supervised computational etymology studies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? We still have a couple of minutes before lunchtime. Yes, please. I agree completely that your database is large in quantity, but I totally disagree that it's large in quality. Um, from what I gather here is that you compile on the basis of Wiktionary. When you go to conferences of historical linguistics, you see that corpus semantics and any insights from corpora have played an immense role the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and a number of professors of English historical linguistics will agree that the Old English Dictionary and the Middle English Dictionary need to be rewritten from scratch because of all the insights that they gained. So my question is, compiling a huge database on Wiktionary, which probably is based on the entries you find in older versions of old dictionaries, isn't that work in vain 
when historical linguistics came to the conclusion that lots of knowledge that we have now from the corpus data should lead to totally different entries. And you would have a totally different database once you compiled your insights on something else than Wiktionary. Uh, because the English Wiktionary and the entries on etymology are also based on old print dictionary because users generate that these entries on the basis of existing print dictionaries usually. And these are not up to scratch, not up to date with the contents, unfortunately. Okay, Plus, so um, yeah. thank you for so this. That's my critical point here. I know, I know. A bit so of a nasty question. Th I know. Thanks for your question. The first, first easy answer is the process is automatic. So once the Wiktionary is updated with uh, more up-to-date information, it's quite easy to recreate a new version of the database. Now, um, the real answer to your question is that I disagree with you um, on the fact that in Wiktionary there is not up-to-date information. For example, we are here in Leiden. As you probably all know, there, is, there are quite a few people in Leiden working on computational linguistics and on, on historical linguistics and specifically on Indo-European linguistics. And they have published quite a few dictionaries in the past years, which are uh, considered, considered by most people as pretty much up to date, even if not, they do not necessarily, uh, necessarily agree with everything that's in there. And you would be surprised, but in Wiktionary, the etymological entries do take into account these light and etymological dictionaries. So the, the etymological information in Wiktionary has been already um, updated with the insights from what has been published in the last few years here in Leiden. So that's just to give you an example that it's not true that the new insights that have been gained in etymological studies in the past years are not at all included and that most entries are to be you know, thrown away. It's, 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 not, it's just not true. Of course there will be some changes and of course Wiktionary will not be as up-to-date as the uh, word studies that can be published from time to time. But on average, it is not as, the situation is not as bad as you described and I think it's far from that. Thank you. Um, quick question, quick answer and then we'll have another. Alexander. Okay, so I, I skipped the introduction of my question. <laughs> it's a question of curiosity. So um, since you display for the results of, um, of um, your computation, I'm wondering if you have thought of an inspection mode. So suppose a user would like to know if your, if, if your uh, computational process, what were the steps, the different steps that when, came to, uh, when you came to it, and I'm wondering if you thought about it, if, it's, if yes, if it's difficult, if it's doable, I think for a user it would be interesting. Uh, okay, thank you for this question. I think it's a very good question, and I think in, in general, uh, when we extract information from online resources, we should keep track of where it comes from, and we should be able to, to visualize the whole process that led to this information. So I totally agree with that. I didn't do it in this first preliminary version, but I, I intend to try and use different types of etymological information sources. First one being um, dictionaries available in PDF format that could be you know, used and extracted. I think there are a few people in this room who, are, who know what I have in mind, and this could serve as a source for, uh, of information. And then there is the Swedish database that I mentioned before. So when I develop, when I develop you know, some, some sort of multi-source new version of the transformation system, then I will have to make sure that everything is properly tracked to the original sources, and then probably it will be interesting to, to try and display this information. Milos? One quick uh, question or remark. Going back to what you said about printed uh, at the very beginning, uh, recently a colleague of mine was uh, in a conversation with uh, one of the uh, Czech collapsing publishers. And, uh, you know, the, I would argue the company has the best Czech English dictionary. The last printed edition that they had, uh, they sold just 40 copies over the past year. And then my colleague asked him, so what is the most sold printed dictionary? And he said, the etymological one. So I fully agree with you, but then my question is, why is that? Is it because of the, the audience, which is so old-fashioned, or why? 
It's very possible, but it's not necessarily the case. For example, just to, to go back to these Leiden dictionaries, um, if I remember well, the databases that have been turned into, into printer dictionaries used to be available online for free, and then they got published by Brill, and now the databases are not available online anymore, or you have to pay for it. So I think it's a combination of the fact that people working in, this, in, in, in historical linguistics are used to paper, used to using paper, and, and not necessarily, like, I think all historical linguists are not um, computer literate to the highest possible degree, and this might play a role as well, but I think the way etymological dictionaries are published also plays a role. Last really quick uh, question I have are, is etymology in Wiktionary the same as in Wikipedia? I think there is no etymology in Wikipedia except for a few, well, a limited number of articles, especially place names sometimes well, I have, have come etymology. across, but in that case I will not take more time for that because uh -huh. everyone's so hungry. Uh, thank you very much but for I don't talk. think it's the same information. Thank you, everyone.